welcome to today's episode of Positively Geared. Lloyd and I are here today in the studio with a very special guest and dear friend of ours, Fabio De Castro of Oxygen Home Loans. Welcome, Fabio. Thanks for having me, mate. Pleasure. Welcome aboard. Fabio has been a really good uh, person within our networks over the years. Um, he's, he's won many accolades, most recently Broker of the Year within the MFAA. Uh, two years running Oxygen Home Loan Broker of the Year. Uh, we're very lucky to have you in the studio today, Fabio. And um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and the, the road to where you got to where you are today? Sure. Now, thanks for having us, guys. Obviously, I worked uh, closely with you and Lloyd for a long, long time. And um, so, yeah, just a little bit about ourselves. I've been in banking for about 12 years uh, prior to that, prior to having my own business, prior to become a broker. So about four let's say four and a half years ago, I started my own company and um, yeah, just been broken since and love what I do. So, And and when you were, were in banking, Fabio, did, did you always know that brokerage would be that sort of natural progression for you? Uh, no, I, I had a good career. I was, I was happy. Uh, everything made sense. And I think not until a, there was a point, there was a point in my time that you know, I became a, what I call a BDM, which is like an account manager. And you go out there and you meet brokers and you sort of um, help them build their business. And there was a part of me that after that just realized that I could I could do something a little bit different. Um, I just thought most brokers are very transactional. So just really focusing on interest rates or saving, which I'm not saying is not important, but I think the point of that when I, when I saw that I saw an opportunity of building something a little bit different, which is more, um, holistic and trying to help people, you know, achieve their dreams, not just the transactions. So that's what we focus for. And then that's what we, yeah, started the business about four years ago, as I said, sorry. <laughs> it's gone very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like a hundred. But <laughs> yeah. You got a few more gray hairs since we first met. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah age a lot in four years <laughs> but it's exciting I, I love what i do but it can be quite tricky yeah and lloyd what's your relation to fabio how did you guys meet yeah so i've known fabio for probably a bit over two years now when i i first met him was basically when i was actually looking for a broker for uh our home our dream home that my wife and i were buying and essentially i had another broker and he had left the industry at the time and I yeah asked for a referral and actually referred me to Fabio. And at the time I was working with a number of other brokers uh, through my business. I was property professionals, but I was wanting to keep sort of what I did with my business and my clients a bit separate to what I did personally. I think essentially I just didn't want my, or my brokers sort of know about my personal finances. <laughs> so I thought I'd, uh, you know, I wanted to have a sort of a, a separate broker for that. So I engaged Fabio and he is absolutely fantastic in, in helping me and my wife secure our, our dream home which is great. And uh, given the fact that I've got uh, quite a lot of properties in my portfolio, uh, along with you know, business income, and I've got to pay employees, and there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that as a broker, you have to sift through, which in, obviously includes tax returns and BAS statements and accountant letters and all sorts of things. And, and he was great there and you know, got us prepared. And I actually uh, wrote, wrote a bit about this in, in the book, Positively Geared, uh, because he got us prepared and, and finance pre-approved uh, just in time for us to go to auction. I guess the end of the story here is that uh, I was so impressed with what he did for us that I really wanted to see if he could actually help some of my clients. And then since then, I've been working with him ever since. And I've actually bought a couple of more properties using his services, but then he's also served a lot of our clients. He gives them great service. Fabio has got a great team uh, around him as well. And yeah, always gives really good advice and, and gets really good results for our clients. So only just over two years since I've been using him, but it's yeah, it's been a long long two years. I mean, I've seen probably got a lot of, a lot of gray hairs there. I've got no gray hairs myself as people will testify. That's because you're the one buying all the property, yeah, mate. <laughs> That's right. Fabio, just, just for, for a bit of a laugh, how was your first experience dealing with Floyd um, on his, because we've, we've, we've spoke a lot about his dream property purchase. And It's a beautiful, it's a yeah. beautiful place. Um, it was quite interesting. I aged a lot. Um, <laughs> Because it was a long process, wasn't it, Lloyd? Like, obviously, Lloyd did something that a lot of people should do. So he had a, a goal, which was to buy his forever home. And he actually did the right thing. He approached a broker before he made that commitment. Because a lot of people do the other way around. So they just say, I want to buy my house. And they just go, bang, just um, put an offer, 
don't look at finance. So call you on the Monday. <laughs> <laughs> you call, call you after the yeah, option. I, I was like, I bought just, a house in the weekend. I just <laughs> bought a house, and um, yeah. So for better or worse, obviously we started that conversation at the time, and Lloyd has a lot of properties. Obviously, as probably everyone knows, and it is it was a complicated sort of structure, but I think it was really positive because it allowed us to get to know each other and we really worked together quite well and and the good thing about lloyd is he was ready to listen because a lot of clients not not like sometimes i'll sit there and look at the whole portfolio and we have to move things around we have to maybe sell a property for you to continue to grow your your asset base and a lot of people were very particular very emotional about it and lloyd wasn't so we had to to move around a few of his properties just to get him ready and so it was a long process, but it was essential for him to do that because it allowed him to keep going. And I, I, I suppose that's the main thing about what that experience created because that's what we do. We really focus on, you just tell us what your long-term goals are and we'll get you ready. It might not be today, but we'll get you there. So, And, and just on that, uh, yeah, and essentially part of that process did involve me selling two properties. And we're financing another property for that dream purchase. And as I always help my uh, my clients with, it's about, you know, looking for those long-term goals. You know, once you're ready to sort of make that dream purchase, it's, it's just like, okay, what can you do with those investments that are going to help you get there? I had uh, a previous home that we'd been living in, which was something that we'd put on the market, had another investment property that had done quite well, uh, needed to sell, sell that one to sort of get all the finance in place. And then we financed another property as well. So a lot of things that we had to actually put into line there. And of course, part of that process was obviously getting a, an extended settlement on the new property we were buying to put everything in place. So a little bit of a stressful time there, uh, particularly for my wife, who was a bit worried about what was what was happening there. Uh, but we all made it work, and now Fabio was a great support. You're you're in good hands. <laughs> Absolutely, Fabio. We I, I suppose we just briefly touched on. You mentioned Lloyd. You know, did everything right. Listened to you. Yeah. Which you know, even in my experience in my industry, getting people to listen to you is a bit of a challenge sometimes. Walk us through. What not to do when applying for finance? Because, I mean, it sounds like Lloyd's known what to do and he's yeah. followed you, but yeah. there's obviously sometimes instances where, you know, you, you've got to put in a bit more time to get people on board. We've got to remember I do finance and it's not exciting or sexy. Like people don't want a mortgage. They want a house and I'm sort of the vehicle to get them there. So I suppose, yeah, the, the hardest part for me is, yeah, people doing the right thing and and getting ready for it. Like we're very big on having conversations. And I had clients that have been talking for two or three years and they never bought a property yet because they got to get there. So I think to answer your question in a very long, long-winded way, mate, sorry. Um, <laughs> first of all, take your emotions out of it. Um, as much as obviously you want to buy your dream home and that's an emotional transaction, you really got to focus on getting ready for it. And not be scared of having a conversation with brokers because a lot of people don't want to talk to a broker. I suppose we had that stigma in the past of like, why would I go to a broker? Like, I'm good enough to go to a bank. And I think people these days are getting used to it. Like, they have to realize that we're not here just because you have bad credit. Like, that's what a broker used to be. Like, oh, I just walked to the Commonwealth Bank branch and I can get a mortgage. It's just really not not be scared about talking about finances. Be honest and upfront with yourself and where you want to be and what's your budget. Because like, a lot of people want to buy property and they come to me and they just started their job or they have minimal savings. But it's okay as well. Like we, We'll have that chat. We'll put a budget in place. We'll, I'm not a financial planner. I used to be one. I'm not allowed to give financial advice, but we sort of give them the roadmap to get them ready. What they do wrong sometimes is just being impulsive and then just really focusing on, I want this, but doesn't matter. Like a lot of people want to live in the Northern beaches, but they don't have the budget for it. And you have to be honest with yourself and maybe get a stepping stone property and then come back to where you want to be. Cause that, that's what I've done. So my first place was in ride, nothing against ride, but I, I lived in Manly. So I didn't want to be in ride, but that's what it worked for me at the time. And it allowed me to build the equity to then move back to the beaches. So. Lloyd, it, what what Fabio said really ties into you know a, lo- a lot of the contents that you you cover in your book, Positively Geared. And I suppose you know what we continue to say we really love about the book is that you know it's the same journey that you've lived. Everything Fabio just said is very much what you had to do to buy your dream home, isn't it? 
well, the very first property I bought was a one bedroom apartment in Rockdale, something I've still got. And it's actually one of those properties that um, Fabio helped me refinance. But that's one of the stepping stones. And so I, I had a one bedroom apartment. And then uh, my next property, which is something I, I sold a few years later, but I actually lived in Ingleburn, which I also note in the book. And that's way out near Campbelltown. <laughs> and at that time, I was working as a teacher and driving into Bondi. So I was sitting in traffic for two or three hours each way. I saw um I saw Ingleburn on the GPS as I was driving back from Canberra yesterday, <laughs> and I finally got to work out I I could, where it was. I think I could have got to Canberra yeah. um, quicker than, than to Bondi. Might so well. uh, I had those stepping stones uh, in place while I was building up to my dream, and your dream doesn't happen overnight, and and you just got to take those stepping stones and everything. It's good, Fabio, to have you in, come in and sort of you know reiterate a lot of the points that we we discuss because you know we do live in in a society where everyone's after that instant gratification it's almost this entitlement not saying everybody's entitled but you know people i'd imagine would come to you and there's this expectation that why can't i borrow this much and you know oh, i don't want to save the extra twenty thousand. You, you'd, you'd see it all the time certainly yeah i suppose these days people and again is not everyone mate because i have clients that earn very little and they're ready because they're they're committed to it like they're willing to take that step and sacrifice. I think sacrifice is the right word because a lot of people don't want to do it. So I have multiple instances, again, like people have this expectation that they want to, what do you mean I can't buy a place in, in, the, in the West where I live? It's just about understanding where you are for right or wrong. And that's what obviously Lloyd's has done with his portfolio. It's just really, it's hard work, right? Like it, you put that in mind and you sacrifice and you, you work the overtime and you put money aside. And unfortunately, we live in a society where people struggle to save. Obviously, we live in Sydney, which is quite expensive, but it's doable. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing that people need to, getting back to what you were talking before about what a broker can do is, uh, I think you know, when you go to a bank, a bank is only going to sell you their services, their solution. And it's only really one solution. And of course, often people will fall for the idea that a uh, you know, a bank says, oh, you know, that they've got the best interest rates and if you buy three or four properties through them, they'll get even better interest rates. And, and people don't really understand what that means when you cross securitize all your properties and, and things like that and can get into trouble. But what I really like about brokers is that there are solutions beyond the big four. So you can go with um, smaller lenders or non-bank lenders. And there are such things as, as low doc loans, uh, for, you know, for people who either have p potentially bad credit or people who, uh, you know, might be self-employed but haven't actually been employed for that long. I mean, there are banks I think Fabio, that uh, might only look at you know one year of tax returns, or or sometimes just look at bank statements and things uh, to help people get across uh, for loans. And and you can't really get that solution if you just go to a particular bank. Absolutely, there's always something we can do as long as it's in line with the the end goal. So a lot of times people stigmatize like um, low doc loans, and, and and it works. Sometimes it works for the right people. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes uh, the cash flow is positive, and you are allowed to to get a low doc loan because you change jobs. Like for example, I'll use myself as an example. I was PAYG my whole life. When I started my business, it's like you start again because you're self-employed. So the banks will look you completely different. And you know, maybe a low doc solution was ready for me. It was the right thing for me at the time. It's, it's about working together with a client. You can start with a low doc in 12, 24 months, just go back to a normal full doc loan, depending on how your business is trading. It's about the it's about the structure. It's about the the goal and what are you trying to achieve, and we're just getting you there. Yeah, Fabio, um, you know, just just talking about people stigmatizing sort of you know your small lenders versus your bigger lenders. Putting that to the side because you've you've touched on it quite well just then. What do you find that most customers that come to you spend most of their time focusing on? Interest rates. They're all the, <laughs> the, um, which I'm not saying is not important, but. Yeah, they watch a TV, they watch a current affair and someone says, I don't know, Koshi or whoever these days <laughs> <laughs> will just say, oh my God, interest rates are low twos. And yeah, they are, absolutely they are, but they're not necessarily might be the right thing for you. Like a uh, perfect example, there's a lot of the online banks are quite cheap, but they don't do self-employed loans. So people that are self-employed and they're building their business, they come to me and they're like, oh, but... I saw this guy doing it online for whatever interest rates it is, and but they don't read the fine print. That yeah, <laughs> you I can't even get the loan there. People, so. people get that confused, don't they? Yes. They, um, yeah. yeah, they want 
everything, they see the low interest rates, but they also don't realize that they're also self-employed and they yeah. don't, they, they're a bit outside the box. Uh, and you know, coming from someone like myself who, you know, self-employed, I run a business, uh, and you know, I've, I've, I've been a P PAYG, uh, employee in the past and I've, you know, I've had low doc loans as well and everything. And, uh, so I've seen the best of both worlds, but it's, it's very important for, for people to realize, uh, what they're getting and how it's going to benefit them and their strategy. I think another thing too is, you know, you mentioned fine print, exit fees, uh, stuff like that, which uh, I guess obviously that a lot of those online lenders and other lenders, like they love to dangle the carrot, obviously. Yeah. Um, but there's so much more to it, particularly if, and I think that's why strategy is so important because if you're planning to buy a property as a stepping stone property, like you mentioned, you might get to a point where you need to offload that. I mean, depending on what the situation is yeah. and you don't want to get caught in a position where you've got the wrong loan and then you've got to come in and fix things later i'm sure that's happened to you in the past yeah a lot of times yeah i think it's more what well, we do very differently like someone comes to us and say i want to i want to buy this house and we always ask just why and as simple as that is people don't have an answer a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> they literally go i just want to buy a house <laughs> and i'm like why like are you did you have a baby like you want to upsize you want to downsize is this it? Like, is this your first home? Is this going to be the forever home? Like, and you just watch them unravel a lot of the times because they don't have an answer for it. And and that comes back to, you know, everything that we do in terms of strategy. I mean, p people often come to us and they, they want to buy a, a certain property. And when I ask them, why do you want to buy there? People don't really know why. It might be because they, they live near there and they can, they can check on it, which obviously isn't something you can really do because that's why you've got a property manager, for example, yeah. or, you know, they don't really understand how that's going to fit into their portfolio at all. You know, whether it's a, a good place to own a property at all, uh, people don't really understand. So it's really a matter of having a strategy and knowing your why. And, and that's, I think pe something that people don't really get and that really people need to think about uh, before they even get to the stage of, uh, you know, looking at the actual property to buy. Absolutely. Fabio, what's the most um, unusual deal you've probably worked on? since you moved into full-time brokerage? Recently, yeah, COVID has been quite interesting um, for the banking industry because if you look at it, even the government, they're just creating rebates and incentives and they're just learning as they go. Obviously, unprecedented times and it's quite hard and we didn't know it was coming. But yeah, just a lot of, um, I had a, a perfect example a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had a dentist that came to um, borrow money and they, they sometimes get special deals because they're dentists and they can get LMI waves and things like that. But he's not working. Like, you, we all know you're not working. Your office is closed. But <laughs> it, it was just when I said I couldn't help him right now, he almost took offense to it. <laughs> and I'm just, it's just really working with clients because, yeah, I, I think the best thing a broker could do is just be upfront. Because a lot of times I get clients that, oh, my broker hasn't called me in three weeks. It's just because he doesn't want to tell you the truth. Like, I feel that that is the case a lot of the time. So with this guy, now that his practice is back to normal, we are helping him with finance. But the initial conversation was a, was quite tough because he didn't want to listen, yeah. What about uh, times where you're trying to help someone with a deal uh, and then you find out they might have not disclosed everything, like maybe <laughs> extra credit cards or, you know, they don't have as many much savings as um, they might have indicated and that's obviously going to come against them. How, how do you handle uh, situations like that? Over the years, we put some um, processes in place because we, we found that as well. Like when I started broking, I don't, maybe lending was different in the times. Like people would just go to their bank and they're like, this is everything that I have and but now everyone has so many things. They have Afterpay, ZipPay, multiple credit cards. They'll buy an interest-free couch with Harvey Norman or whatever it is. And it's a credit card. Like at the end of the day, and people don't know that. So we have certain tools that we use. We, we scrape all their accounts and we go through the fine detail to make sure we're seeing transactions that, you know, sometimes they don't tell you because, yeah, I, I had a client last week that said, I said, okay, I need all your accounts. And he just kept sending me one and I knew there was more. And I was like, why are you not giving me that? And he goes, the more I tell you, the, the less I can borrow. But um, unfortunately, the, um, the broker is the guy that you tell everything because we'll find you a solution. Just tell me everything because it's like you're trying to do something, but you just give me half of the information. I can't, you know what I mean? Because a lot of times we apply for a loan with positive credit scoring. Like banks know everything. They know if you pay your bills on time, how many credit cards you have, what's the limit? Like it's an open 
field right now and people still have this misconception that they can go oh i'm not going to tell him about this credit card <laughs> and we're always fine so i, I suppose is trying to be very upfront and say you need to tell me everything like there's nothing wrong with having a credit card just let's go through it and we'll help you get there find the right solution fabio you, you briefly touched on sort of covid before um what changes do you see happening or do you anticipate to happen in terms of what what covid's done for the financial industry a lot of stuff already is happening um yeah the banks like the government are sort of learning as they go um when everything started it took a couple of weeks but most of the lenders started getting a little bit more conservative um in terms of lending for self-employed so i'll give you an example someone is self-employed we generally look at two years tax returns and off you go because we always looked in the past now the banks want to see current transactions like you got to show the basses if you don't have basses we got to show bank statements because they need to see that the business is actively trading on the same trend that regardless of COVID, there was lenders that completely left the market and stopped lending there was banks that will change their policy so a lot of people have overtime commissions it started with people only people that were affected so it started the banks started with like oh if you're in hospitality or if you're in um entertainment whatever it is we won't take your overtime uh but then that's sort of slowly gravitated towards every industry so even people in it or people that always worked from home they were never impacted i still the bank side while well, being a little bit more cautious about lending yeah. i don't know if you brought your crystal ball this morning <laughs> <laughs> i didn't i didn't see you walk in with it <laughs> I, l- I left it in the car yeah the car. <laughs> well at least, at least you brought it uh how, how do you see how do you see the sort of the this space over the next 12 to 24 months um, it will be interesting to see if we don't get another wave, like Victoria just had some issues, like with a lot of COVID cases coming across. I, I suppose there's two answers to it. If we don't, I think things are going to go back to normality. Um, banks are understanding a little bit more about the market. Like uh, as an example, JobKeeper, a lot of people are on JobKeeper supplement, like the, the, the employer is using JobKeeper to supplement their income and most banks won't take it. But now over the last couple of weeks, we saw three or four banks saying, yep, okay, we get it. It's income, let's use it. So I suppose if we don't have another spike, I think things will go back to normal. If we do have another spike, I think, yeah, all bets are off. We don't, I don't really know. Do you think that um, in terms of JobKeeper, that also depends on the industry that they might be in, whether they, uh, the banks can see whether there's a future for that particular uh, business or whether there's potential there, you know, some businesses might go under and then they think that employee is more at risk? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. There, there, is, there, are, there are a little bit more cautious if it's a pub owner or someone that works in hospitality or someone that works at flight center or someone that works at a sort of aviation. So those are still quite tough. Uh, but I have, like, I had someone that was a telemarketer and, you know, she'll have a job. It's just that the employer obviously applied for a job keeper and he was eligible for it. So the banks were okay with it. And we got a letter from the employer that, you know, she will go back to work full time and they will, once the job keeper ends, they will still pay her. So, yeah, I think so, man. Depending on the industry, there'll still be a little bit more restriction around it. And I think either way, uh, yeah, this period is still a good time for people to be planning what they want to do next, even if they aren't in a situation to, and Alex and I talk about this a fair bit, that even if you're not in a position to be able to borrow right at the moment, uh, start planning and getting yourself in that position so you can um, borrow, whether it's later in the year or or next year and things, uh, and just try to make sure all your, your ducks are lined up. Absolutely. I think too, it's a good segue into just underlining the importance, you know, in, in times of uncertainty, you got to have the right, you know, you talk about the dream team, Lloyd, in, in your book, Positively Geared. And, you know, it's so true, you know, having a great broker, um, particularly at the moment, I think aligning yourself with a really good buyer's agent, Lloyd, is worth its weight in gold um, to be able to navigate this this period because, you know, you don't want to also sit on the fence for the next five years and and just hope that everything goes back to normal. Now's, now's always the best time to take action, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what Fabio was um, talking about before, where he sits down, he always tries to find a solution for a client and he might have had clients who have been 
you know, done nothing for two or three years, but uh, he's still trying to get them ready is, is important. And, um, and that's um, essentially what I do. I mean, I've, I've had clients that I've been talking to for a couple of years and then they sort of finally pull the trigger once they're ready. Um, but it is really important to, to start planning, start being strategic and start putting a team around you. And, and, and part of that team is, is, you know, having that, that broker who can really assess you because a bank's not going to give you that same level of service, I believe. I believe a good broker will actually help, I guess, educate you and show you how you can get yourself finance ready uh, to move forward. It's not just a matter. And as Fabio said, it's, you know, interest rates are certainly not the most important thing. So you shouldn't be going anywhere and, and thinking, okay, what's the best interest rate I'm getting now? You should be going and looking at how I can get myself finance ready to be able to buy in the future. And then, you know, aligning yourself and maybe getting advice, obviously, from an accountant is another very good person to be getting uh, some advice from as well. And if you engage a buyer's agent, then you can start formulating that team who then can all work together and, uh, you know, with my clients who work with me over the long uh, period of time, uh, that team stays the same. You find the right people that you like to work with, then you, you can work with them over the long period of time. So, you know, Fabio has done some multiple deals with some of my clients and those clients also uh, use the same accountant or the same solicitor to do the conveyancing and so on. So they've got the, the same team that they're, they're building along the way to get that same advice. It's important that everyone on the team actually knows what the client is trying to achieve. So you're not actually trying to explain your goals to a different person every time. So you're not trying to just buy a property every time and then telling people what you want to do. Have your goals in place and then build your team and then start acquiring properties to try to achieve those goals. Lloyd, what's a good example of a time where in your buyer's agency, uh, you've been able to draw on Fabio's expertise to help one of your clients move to their next step of life or possibly acquire a first property? Uh, Alex, there's probably quite a few examples there, but one that does come to mind is someone who uh, came to me looking for actually their first investment property, but they actually had their own broker at the time. When they came to see me, I suggested they might like to get a second opinion from another broker and they ended up uh, speaking to Fabio and then decided not to take Fabio's advice at the time, but they uh, went back and used their own broker. Their broker actually f uh, f had the application failed twice with two different banks, which is um, pretty, you know, pretty bad really because the broker should really be able to see where the application is going to pass before they actually submit it because it can affect the credit rating. So what actually happened then was uh, when the client came back to me not able to get finance, I suggested that m maybe he could just try Fabio one more time because Fabio at this stage hadn't, you know, he hadn't done anything for the client. But I suggested that yeah, maybe Fabio, because, you know, Fabio is just, uh, you know, really knowledgeable uh, and is always happy, happy to give advice. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, uh, the client ended up getting uh, approval. Uh, despite the fact that he'd already had two rejections from banks, uh, which probably uh, had a mark on his credit rating, he you know, got approval and we ended up getting getting him a, an investment property. Fabio, would you like to build on that? Yeah, I think that was the, I suppose that was the perfect example of someone that just didn't want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so we, he, he had, obviously it was his first property and um, he never had credit cards and never had anything, which is good but he never had, he never built on his credit report. So when he came to me and the deposit was quite minimal um, and he was buying an investment property. So f I gave him a solution, which was a few banks that would ignore like genuine savings and things like that at the time, which was the right thing for him. Um, but in the end, I, I suppose people sometimes get caught up with the barbecue conversations, isn't it, Lloyd? Everyone has a as an opinion, everyone's an expert. <laughs> well, it pretty much is. It, it, and Alex and I talk about it a fair bit. It's about the su Sunday afternoon yeah. um, barbecue stuff. E everyone loves property. Everyone's an expert. Uh, and yeah, maybe people do know the, the local banker or the local broker down the road or, or speak to Michael. He knows all about finance. Because it, exactly what happened. Like his broker was, a, I think, is a friend of a friend. And yeah, he just didn't want to listen. And at the end of the day, like we're, we're very open about it because at the end of the day, it has to be a transaction that has to be synergy between us. Like obviously um, not every client is the right client and I'm, I, I might not be the right broker for that particular person. And at, at that point and we've done the numbers and I said, this is where I, I stand and this is my advice. And obviously didn't want to listen. And to be honest, to his credit, he came back though. Cause a lot of people don't, a lot of people, the ego gets in a way and they don't come back. He's a young guy and he was, he actually called me. He's like, I'm really sorry. I went through someone else and, is there anything you can do here? And, and that's quite important as well. Like you have to be able to, to realize that and, and regroup. And I think the other thing also that I've, uh, I really like that what Fabio does is he'll often give advice to, uh, to someone I've referred to him. And then uh, Fabio might say to the client, 
I can't actually help you at this stage because you've actually got a good deal from your current broker or from your current bank. Um, but maybe I might be able to help you in the future. And I think that's really good customer service as well. So, uh, so it's not a matter of, you know, Fabio trying to get every deal, uh, whatever it's, it's cause some, in some cases, uh, a client might, might already have a good, uh, be in a good situation with their with their current bank, but yeah, moving forward into the future, there might be an opportunity for them, um, yeah, to work with with Fabio and things like that as well. Fabio, how often do you find yourself beyond new applications for loans, possibly revisiting people's property portfolios, you know, for refinance and restructuring? Is that a, a key part of your business, or is it sort of ad hoc? No, no, um, we have a um, like a plan in place. In place, sorry. So obviously we. We'll help them with the initial assessment and they settle their loan and we sort of revisit that every 12 months. So we touch base with the client obviously all the time and make sure everything's okay. But the first year we tend to go back to their current lender on their behalf and trying to negotiate a better rate just to sort of improve their cash flow position. And then that will allow them to, depending on their goal, get ready for the next one, for the second, the third, or the fourth. So we do touch base with clients every year. Um, it's not mandatory. It's just something that we do as a business because we find it quite important. Yeah, based on their goals and strategies because a lot of times you got to go back and touch base with people and make them accountable. You know what I mean? Like say they, they said, oh, I'm going to buy this property now and my goal is to bet and get another one next year. So we always touch base with individuals' time frames and say, okay, how are you tracking? Because that's quite important as well. It's not about, here's a mortgage and I'll see you never. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it's just really revisiting the client and, and just because things change and, and we want to make sure that the goal is still there. And because a lot of times they're like, okay, I wanted to buy two more properties, but now I'm having a baby or I, I changed my mind or I don't want to do this. So it's, yeah, we always touch base with clients just to make sure the goals are still in place. And, and that also ties into to what we do um, in our buyer's agency because we actually give our clients a portfolio checkup every six months. Uh, so essentially six months after they've had settlement of a property, uh, we'll advise them on what we think the, um, the market has been doing and, and whether they might like to look at getting some um, equity out or leaving it for another six months and then refinancing, uh, in which case we then refer them back to their, to their broker, which um, yeah, may be uh, Fabio. Uh, and that ties into the fact that the next purchase might be for another investment, might be for another development, it might be for their dream home. Uh, so it all works hand in hand. Fabio for, Fabio, for people listening today who are new to property investing or possibly on their first property and you know they've only held it for a short period of time in relative terms, uh, how soon would you suggest that that individual does a pulse check on their financial position and you know revisit their their mortgage and make sure that they're on still on the best deal or, or, or the best deal for them in the market today like as soon as possible always it's good to have a chat like just even as i said before like a lot of times don't want, people don't want to do it but they're like oh i don't have enough savings or because a lot of times they do that's the funniest part they come and they're like oh i don't think i have enough and i'm like yeah you're doing okay like <laughs> you you do have enough and if you don't you're so close so I suppose as long as you have a goal, because a lot of times people just, they save for the sake of saving and they're like, okay, I'm going to buy a property, so I'm going to start saving. So that's their thought process, but there's never a goal behind it. Like they, they just do it for the sake of it. So even talking at early stages is okay because we can sit down and say, okay, this is how much you can save a year, which represents a deposit of X, Y, Z. And that's where you live. That's where you want to live. This is where you can do... So as long as it's more, I think we're going to make it more palpable, like something more structured. And so, yeah, revisit as often as you can, but yeah, start as soon as possible. How do you help people who, you know, you have that sort of meeting with and, you know, you sort of say, okay, well, this is what I think we can do over the next four to five year period. Are you sometimes greeted with people who are a little discouraged or underwhelmed by what they can do? Do you think people underestimate having a longer term goal and plan? Yeah, they do. Like, don't you find that, Lloyd? Like, yeah, absolutely. Some... <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have the patience or... I think um, if people t tend not to have the patience and I think what's really important is, is having that plan and then keeping yourself accountable. Uh, and that's where having, you know, a mentor or, or some advisors who can actually keep you accountable. Uh, and that's whether that's a property mentor, whether that's an accountant, uh, whether that's a, a mortgage broker or, or even a financial planner who can be with you that 
uh, in that long run because you have that that long term plan, but then you know, people are too impatient. They want everything now. They want that that dream house now, or they think, oh, I can't, I'm not, never going to be able, able to afford you know, <laughs> a, a home, so I just go and buy a nice car. And that's just that's not really going to work because you, you can actually have both if you you know, plan for it and you you know, take your time and you actually are patient for it. Lloyd and Fabio, this is sort of an open question for you both, but Fabio, possibly you can begin by elaborating on the point. In your experiences, for clients that are building a property portfolio, um, you know, they typically will get to a point where they might max out on their borrowing capacity at a given period of time. Uh, Lloyd, in his book, Positively Geared, talks a lot about strategies to create instant equity and, and how to, I suppose, drive a portfolio moving forward to ensure that you can be accountable and work towards the long-term goal. Some of those things we've spoken about are duplex developments, obviously construction loans, um, you know, a part of that and you'd have experience in that. What's your overall view in terms of creating equity and, and the importance of it? Yeah, that's why um, I really admire what Lloyd does because a lot of times we we see their clients just really continue to grow their portfolio and, and lending, it has been quite tough since the GFC. Like the banks are quite strict in terms of lending. So if you have your second or third or fourth property, that's when you start getting really strapped in terms of borrowing capacity and what Lloyd does really well which it works is yeah the the duplex construction so I, I do like your strategy Lloyd of the second or the third property just really seem to be you know a dual income sort of maybe a granny flat maybe you know a duplex because he allows them to move forward there's more income for us to work with and also the subdivisions as well like when you when you build a duplex and you subdivide and you create that equity because as we touched point before um Sydney's quite hard for you to save money and life is expensive sometimes people want to have the car <laughs> so you know what i mean so when he creates that equity he allows us to then have a have a deposit to keep going so the equity in combination with the dual income it's allowing us to build a portfolio here that goes even further you know the first duplex that i built for myself was actually just after the the gfc uh, so, and then things were starting to get a little bit tighter for me. I probably had about four or five properties at the time. And, uh, we've spoken before Alex about that sort of being my aha moment and, uh, yeah, creating that equity and then having that, that dual cash flow really allowed me to move forward and then allowed me to acquire some more properties straight away, which I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Uh, so that, that really formed the basis of, of strategies that I, I still help my clients with, uh, to this, this day. And I think, yeah, what uh, we have found and working with Fabio and, and with other brokers is that. You know, having that additional income really does help the the clients being able to uh, to service better. Uh, and with the subdivision, uh, you know, that chance of creating that equity just means that they're just getting that deposit, uh, you know, sooner. So they're just not waiting for that solely on that capital growth and things. Fabio, for people listening that might have just had a light bulb moment and thought, you know what, this could be a great way moving forward to continue building wealth. And I do believe for many people, they probably haven't considered the option unless they've got, you know, previous experience or possibly a building background. Um, what sort of criteria will the bank, is there typically a rule of thumb that banks will look for in terms of doing a new construction or subdivision to sort of demonstrate what your, your overall sort of net profit margin might be on that? It, it gets a little bit trickier and that's why, you know, we work really well with Lloyd because we've done so many of those and there's an extra element that you have to consider. You obviously... Um, it's going to be an investment property, so you need at least 10% plus stamp duty. Um, but also, yeah, really ensure you're going to the right bank because a lot of banks don't do two dwellings in one title. And a lot of people, again, it goes back to if you go to your bank, it, they might not do that. So they just sort of stop you from achieving that dream because they're like, no, you can't do that. You can. There's banks that will do, there's banks that won't do. So I suppose from that point of view, it, it takes a little bit more research and you have to find the right broker for it or someone that is understand they've done that before. Yeah. And I have had clients who've uh, come to me uh, who are, got their own bank uh, and then they want to do a, a construction loan and then, yeah, the bank doesn't, doesn't allow that. And that's really uh, put the clients in a difficult position. Sometimes we've even been exchanging in a block of land and then, uh, you know, the bank, the client tells me what bank they're with and then it doesn't work. Uh, so that's also a bit of a learning experience for me to make sure I'm across what they're, what they're doing, but, but also, uh, you know, going to a broker and also a broker that's experienced with construction loans that, that knows what banks are doing them and also what LBR uh, banks will do them at because some banks will do them at 90% LVR. Some might only do them at 70% where you need to pay a 30% de deposit plus costs and 
uh, there's there's all sorts of issues there. So there's a, again, you just need to make sure you get the right advice. So we hope everyone that's listened today has really taken away a few good points from our time with Fabio today. Fabio, thanks so much for coming in. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. I appreciate it. And and Lloyd, obviously, a lot of these points, you know, we've we've you've really covered in great detail in Positively Geared. Uh, highly recommend that people get a copy of that book. Uh, otherwise, is there anything else, Lloyd, you wanted to add before we close off on this episode? Uh, no, look, uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Fabio. Uh, I think we've you know had a had a great chat today, and uh, look forward to um, our next episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you.